Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll add my thanks uh, to, for being invited here. It's a great pleasure and honor to be part of a celebration of the life and work of, of Professor Taylor. <clears throat> this uh, presentation is a summary of a longer piece, so uh, apologies in advance to the people whose work I brush over quite superficially here. Um, the title, by the way, is What is Wrong with Positive Liberty? And it's meant to be a substantive question. It is not a statement, as you'll see. The idea of freedom plays such a complex and powerful role in political discourse that it's no surprise that philosophical controversies about its meaning has seemed so, to go on so endlessly. Um, in those seemingly endless conversations, um, about the nature of freedom, the contrast between seeing a freedom as purely a function of open spaces, as the opportunity to act without interference from others on the one hand, and seeing it as the positive ability for effective, authentic agency on the other, is still a meaningful one. Charles Taylor has done much, if not the most, to develop this latter notion and to resist views of freedom seen as mere opportunities to act on our desires. Despite these efforts, however, theorists have continued with attempts to carve out a purely negative sense of liberty that avoids, allegedly, what they see as the pitfalls of its positive cousin, but still picks out the fundamental component of existing free societies that is valuable about those societies, as well as what is the object of struggle for the enslaved and the oppressed. In my remarks here, I want to look closely at some selective aspects of these recent attempts to resuscitate a purely negative model of freedom, and in particular for the reasons these theorists give for rejecting positive alternatives. In so doing, I want to help underscore what, is, what it is about positive understandings of free agency that are so compelling in articulating our fundamental social ideals. Indeed, what this will show will be how positive conceptions, in particular those inspired by Charles Taylor's work, uniquely highlights the way that social, re social relations figure centrally in accounts of individual freedom. But acknowledging this connection between freedom and social relations will further reveal some of the unique challenges and tensions that positive approaches to freedom must now face, I think, and in particular in a global landscape marked by increased geographical and transnational mobility and new forms of vulnerability and op oppression that come with these factors. First, though, some remarks on the new negative liberty and what is still wrong with it. Theorists such as Matthew Kramer, Ian Carter, Hillel Steiner, and others have been attempting in recent years in the philosophical literature to carefully carve out a defensible conception of liberty in a negative sense that they argue represents a truly neutral, empirically measurable form of that idea. Such a concept, they claim, avoids the pitfalls of both positive notions and rival negative concepts that they say yield untoward implications or would sanction overly invasive political programs. The motivation in general is to develop this idea squarely within the confines of a liberal empiricism where value neutrality and measurability of freedom are paramount desiderata. As with traditional notions of freedom articulated by Hobbes, Hume, Bentham, and others, these theorists insist that liberty is characterized principally in terms of the opportunity to act. Paraphrasing K Kramer's version of this view, a person is free to do X if and only if she is able to do X, and she is unfree to do X if and only if she would, would be able to do it in the absence of <clears throat> being directly or indirectly prevented from doing so by another. Note that no reference to agents' values or desires is made in these models. This is done in order to capture how freedom has non-specific value on these views, how it is generally measurable by external observation, at least in principle, and how it does not reduce to or presuppose contentious moral values that reasonable people may question. Charles Taylor famously took issue with uh, similar such notions, such value-independent notions, in his classic article, What is Wrong with Negative Liberty?, and he did so with a complex argument, but one that pivoted around a telling uh, example where he compared two societies, one with, without traffic lights but no freedom of religion, and, uh, and the other with religious freedom but many traffic lights. The latter is clearly, he argues, the freer society, even if it turns out that traffic lights constrain far more actions than religious restrictions do, measured simply by neutral counting. 
But religious activity is far more valuable than driving without stopping, so the judgment of greater freedom must rest on the greater importance religious activity has, for example. Theorists have responded to Taylor's claim along various lines over the many years <clears throat> since he wrote that. Carter's general worry about what he calls value-based conceptions like this, and he thinks all relevant positive accounts are value-based in this way, is that they cannot account for freedom's non-specific value. It is its value independent of the work that is its value, independent of the worth of particular pursuits it makes possible. For seeing freedom as valuable only by way of its connection to these pursuits makes it redundant in the political evaluation of social conditions, he argues. Moreover, it makes the measurement of overall freedom either incoherent or similarly redundant on the measure of a person's ability to pursue specific valued ends. But if it is freedom we care about and not merely people's abilities to satisfy their interests or achieve uh, valued modes of well-being, this will not do, he argues. But the lesson from earlier critiques of negative liberty, such as Professor Taylor's, was not merely that seeing freedom as mere opportunity robs that condition of its value. It also undercuts our ability to meaningfully count constraints and opportunities themselves. Seeing freedom, as Carter does, as purely a function of the physical space one is able to occupy in a, as, uh, that allow one's array of jointly compossible actions, um, a space that's determined by other people, implies that freedom is enlarged or contracted whenever any change in one's physical environment is made at all. Such a view rests on a highly contentious theory of action, according to which actions can be individuated simply by abilities, intentions, and physical movements, rather than teleologically oriented and socially coordinated practices, for example. The problem is that such a conception of action individuation yields the judgment that any of the most trivial changes in my environment enlarges or expands my freedom insofar as it allows, us, allows more intentional physical movements for me, however, inconsequ however inconsequential those expansions are. Now Matthew Kramer bites and swallows this bullet whole and argues, for example, that one's freedom is enhanced whenever a person is born in the world since this adds to the total conceivable actions now available to me, that is, those involving that person. He then adds, however, val value multipliers to the calculation of how much overall freedom this, now, this new option adds, and thereby admits that it is vanishing, vanishingly small. But this means that floors and ceilings must be counted as constraints in this framework because they stop possible actions I might perform. Imagine an emergency where I have to cut through the ceiling in order to escape. Um, but this way of measuring the extent of my freedom renders the concept entirely inert in calculations of the valu valuable elements of my social space. Attempting to see freedom solely in terms of neutral counting of opportunities without reference to agents' value perspectives is to lose sight of what makes defining and measuring freedom a crucial theoretical pursuit. What matters first are the purposes and values that give meaning to our uh, plans and projects so that the idea of freedom can be built from that vantage point rather than simply counting open avenues to movement. This was Taylor's original point and it reemerges here. Now it's true that seeing freedom as conceptually connected to the values of agents or indeed to values per se has long raised questions from liberal corners about the ways such an approach will run afoul of the requisite value neutrality required of liberalism. This was much the thrust of Isaiah Berlin's critique in two concepts. Ian Carter argues that seeing freedom as Taylor does as a function of what is valuable in life over and above our first level motivations fails as the basis of a measure of overall freedom since there is no plausible way of distinguishing, weighing, and comparing such valuations in a neutral and unproblematic, that is, liberal manner. What is required is indeed an argument for the nature of positive liberty that is not overly specific so as to collapse into other concepts that make reference to liberty per se odious, or to attach to specific pursuits the value of which is reasonably contestable. And many have attempted to work out such a conception of freedom as effective agency, as self-government or personal autonomy, and so, <clears throat> which does not run afoul of these commitments to diversity, tolerance, and value neutrality, characteristic of our ideals for diverse liberal democracies. 
Let us then turn our attention to the broad contours of such approaches in order to see how they depart from mere opportunity frameworks by focusing on conditions of effective agency and self-government, and in this way better capture the connection between freedom and value and better locate the way that liberty functions as the object of social struggle. Next section. The, more, the most promising approach to seeing freedom in a positive register uh, involves, I think, following Charles Taylor in understanding the self of self-government as fundamentally dialogical structured by social dynamics that are themselves marked by rich symbolic structures and cultural meanings and which requires modes of interpersonal and public recognition of identities. It must also be sensitive to the multiform dynamics of power and oppression that constrain not only action opportunities and way, ways of being in the world, but reflection, self-understanding, and the very processes of subject form formation themselves. Now many, including my co-panelist Nancy Hirschman, have taken various routes to examine and develop similar ideas. My own meager contribution to this effort has been under the rubric of autonomy. The broad contours of that approach are that positive freedom, or autonomy as I'm using it here, contains conditions of, on the one hand, effective agency, and on the other, authenticity, as I'll explain. The first includes basic capabilities for reflection, choice, and action that include, for example, the absence of certain debilitating con uh, conditions, as well as access to various resources and social conditions that make decision and choice feasible. I am sensitive, by the way, that the, uh, to the charge that any such list of basic capabilities or corresponding disabilities threatens to disenfranchise the agency of the oppressed, so such an account must be subtle and complex, of course. Now, authenticity co uh, conditions, on the other hand, bear a nominal relation to Taylor's notion of authenticity as he works it out in his later work, but it should, not, but it should be understood on its own terms. The condition as I describe it, uh, describe it relates to a person's ability to reflectively accept her basic motives in light of and reflexively guided by what I call her diachronic practical identity. This is a conception of identity that is social as well as historical, embodied and structured by a complex matrix of socio-cultural and interpersonal dynamics. This idea of a diachronic practical identity is meant to capture the basic evaluative orientation that both makes sense of past choices, including regretful and shameful ones, and guides current decisions and ongoing plans. It need not fully be tra transparent to us, settled nor articulatable, and it is not simply a set of propositions about what is valuable for us, or sacred, or ideal. It is an orienting structure with cognitive and affective elements that shapes moral perception as well as forms the basis of choice. My view is that positively, the positively free person is able to accept her basic motives amidst her social conditions from the perspective of this practical identity upon reflection in light of her past and ongoing self-development, and to do so without deep self-alienation. This reflection, in the reflection I mention, is not the disengaged reflection of the unembedded subject of classical liberal theory, <clears throat> but an embedded reflection that asks us, what does it mean to be this or that type of person in light of one's social space and in confrontation and communication with others, including what are the implications for being such a person for those others? Now this is a procedural model of self-government only in the sense that it makes no substantive reference to particular values in its conditions and in, the way, um, and in this way can be seen as an attempt to steer around standard liberal objections to such notions. For this is to adopt a conception of freedom that is not, if not value neutral, is at least value invariant across a wide array of reasonably con contestable moral and ethical orientations the kind of value flexibility that allows for social encounters and deliberative interaction with others in diverse democratic social space. Now, such a proceduralist view might rankle the followers of Charles Taylor who embrace his denigration of procedur proceduralist liberalism more generally. Um, and I take uh, seriously that worry but the view of embedded self-acceptance that my view of auth authenticity expresses is proceduralist only in the sense that it describes the dynamics of socially structured negotiation of our self-understandings without specifying in advance the particular value formations that such negotiations must in the end aspire to. 
all of us are stru structured by such value formations, but being positively free, in my view, does not require that we, we are correct in such pursuits in the final analysis. Correspondingly, and crucially on my view, such an approach does not allow us to say of others that since they are incorrect in their value frames, they lack the self-government necessary to gain them a seat at the table of social negotiation in the first place. But this view of self-government, as I said, takes fully on board the view of the self as socially structured and so in need of interpersonal recognition and support in the processes of self-construction and negotiation just adumbrated. In this way, it shares with many uh, concomitant views that put social relations at the center of our conception of freedom, in particular relations that involve the expression of respect for one's culturally inflected practical identity. So let's turn to those elements of these views. Another apparent traditional contrast between negative and positive freedom has been uh, that negative freedom uh, holds on to a greater extent the traditional individualism of liberalism. But I think that this is, uh, contrast is overdrawn in that even negative accounts, in the recent literature at least that I've been examining, have virtually all included a condition that re reveals a particularly evaluative stance on social relations themselves. That is, in these views, the opportunity, these opportunity accounts of freedom generally share the insistence that the only barriers to action that officially count as limitations on liberty are those put in place by other persons. From one perspective, this seems puzzling in that the experience of a person facing barriers to movement will have the character it does independently of how that movement came to be put in uh, circumscribed. But defenders of this view, including Berlin in his take on this matter when he addressed it in the revision of his lectures, insisted that the barriers to movement put in place by others have a special significance in relation to measuring freedom. Now, Matthew Kramer, a defender of the negative conception, admits that there's no non-circular way to explain why only human-sourced restraints count in, uh, as restrictions in negative theories, though he maintains it, maintains, uh, it has a special significance in endeavors to define freedom. But negative accounts have face a special challenge here, for in their drive toward ensuring the value neutrality and the empirical observability of liberty, they have few resources from which to draw to account for why restrictions are that are caused by others count in any unique way in our appraisal of freedom. Um, now what I think this reveals is that these views really do have an evaluative stance about proper social relations, but one which is suppressed. Now, positive approaches to freedom allow us to look further into the dynamics of agency to find a solution to this problem taking account how self-government can fail when any of the multiform requirements of socially situated action are lacking. External restrictions take on special character as restraints when they function to prevent valued pursuits by socially structured agents. This reference to the social constituents of the self can motivate the conceptual attention to certain barriers and not others in counting constraints, but it also allows notions of freedom to capture forms of oppression whose structure is independent of simply the number of physical options one enjoys. The connection between types of constraints uh, and a person's socially structured being is strikingly illustrated in a passage from Frederick Douglass's narrative of, the li of his life, where he writes about a, fi uh, a final cruelty done to his grandmother um, by her slave masters. He says that these masters, um, he says of these masters, that, quote, to cap the climax of their base ingratitude and fiendish barbarity, they took my grandmother to the woods, built her a little hut, put up a little mud chimney, and then made her welcome to the privilege of supporting herself there in perfect loneliness, thus virtually turning her out to die. If my poor old grandmother now lives, she lives to suffer in utter loneliness. She lives to remember and mourn over the loss of children, the loss of grandchildren, and the loss of great-grandchildren. Unquote. What is remarkable about this passage is that in the chronicle of countless acts of violence, murder, rape, and forced labor that constitute slavery as described in the narrative, Douglas chooses an act of separation as one which, quote, more than another served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery, unquote. 
The source of coercion in this gra- of his grandmother was the same whether she was being forced to work or forced to live in isolation. But the severing of her ties with her children fractured more profoundly her social self-understanding. Only accounts of freedom that take social relations properly into account can explain Douglas's view, and our own, I would submit, that this final act of forced seclusion denied her her liberty even more profoundly than those earlier restrictions. Attempts to capture the fundamental relational nature of agency and hence of freedom have taken numerous forms, uh, many of which are parallel to and inspired by Professor Taylor's rich account. In particular, Taylor's insistence on the dialogical nature of self-understanding has carried with it the need for social recognition as a central component of that dialogical process. This social recognition of one's cultural, religious, and or social identity is part of the establishment and maintenance of social self-government. Many other such views um, emphasize the role of social recognition in characterizing autonomy or freedom. In these models, it is argued that freedom involves recognition not merely as a contingent causal contributor to one's capacity for self-government, but as a constitutive condition of self-government itself. Modes of social recognition are in this way required in order to secure one's status as a participant in a discursive process of social self-construction. What is often implied in such approaches, however, is that the recognition in question has as its object the structured practical identity of the other, the culturally or morally inflected sense of self that engages in the interpersonal dialogue characteristic of socially situated agency. Notice, however, that it might be construed that these practical identities that meet each other in social space have a settled character, since respect for the other that is required is respect for the particular commitments expressed by that character. Now, in my own approach, Relations of recognition and respect for the other's practical identity um, that are required for self-government are not specified as a priori requirements for freedom as such. Rather, I maintain that self-government will require such recognition as a general and highly variable psychological necessity whose importance is contingent on that agent's needs for self-affirmation in order, for example, to act competently and effectively. In other words, In other words, relations with others are not conceptual a priori conditions of agency, but causal requirements whose contours vary with the case in question. Insofar as selves are constituted by certain social relationships, then maintenance and support for those relationships will be necessary for self-government, but the insofar in that last phrase cannot be overemphasized. For as we'll now discuss, models of positive liberty that exclude such flexibility and contingency yield untoward judgments about both the value of freedom and the requirements for attaining it. In this light, I want to close with a discussion of how requirements of social recognition and models of freedom face new challenges in current global conditions. These conditions include increased transnational and cross-cultural mobility, where special needs exist to renegotiate one's social self-understanding. Such needs carry with them new vulnerabilities and modes of oppression. In many current settings, settled identities, stable life situations, or fixed geopolitical locations cannot be assumed for the agents in question whose freedom we care about. Properly confronting these realities will force us to think further about the implications and presuppositions of accounts of freedom that tie that that concept to relational dynamics of social recognition of settled identities. Final section, challenges to freedom, geographical mobility, and the fragility of identity. Globalization in general and labor migration specifically has produced unprecedented numbers of people who live in communities separate from their geographical and cultural homes. It's estimated that some 2.9% of the global population falls into this category. Um, Of particular relevance here are the uh, huge numbers of individuals who are dislocated either by, um, by forced processes, such as labor smuggling, human trafficking, natural disasters, or violent conflict. In these categories are individuals who find themselves in conditions of social dislocation, disorientation, and distress as a result of coercion, fraud, violence, or extreme need. Of course, social relocation is nothing new, even involuntary relocation. But the pronounced increase in the degree of especially coerced transfers of people 
forces us to ask the question um, in a new way, what does freedom mean for such persons and how should it be understood as an ideal? Now first, those who manage to escape the violent coercive conditions of, for example, forced labor, must often attempt to find a new way of life in uh, their uh, host location as an immigrant or internally displaced person and, may, and also not have realistic opportunities to return to their homeland. It is these types of individuals that, quest that questions of self-trust and social recognition become most complicated and poignant. The persons liberated from overtly coercive circumstances must still face a long road to achieving a socially supported social existence. The person will often face options, um, few options, since deportation is often directly threatened, but as I said, returning home is often prohibited. For such individuals, and indeed for many migrants, stateless persons and other smuggled and trafficked people, the possibilities of freedom involved have a, um, involve a treacherous negotiation in a new and often threatening social and cultural environment. What is at least required um, in, in such settings for the reestablishment of effective agency is a supportive um, setting within which this renegotiation can possibly take place. This requires that members of the destination society, including principally the aid workers or law, or law enforcement personnel who are at the front lines in these confrontations, but also various others who will be affected by these relocation processes, must be willing to both recognize but also engage in mutual reconstruction of the diachronic practical identities in question, both their own and those others they encounter. In this way, a simple model of the confrontation with the other as a fusion of settled and structured moral horizons will not be adequate for achieving the embedded social self-government we are conceptualizing. This is not to imply that approaches to freedom and recognition like Taylor's are insensitive to such fluidity and social dynamics, but in describing the virtues of democratic cooperation required for social self-governance, we must be careful to allow for the dynamic fluid and fragile nature of such encounters, ones um, very much characterized by radical asymmetries of power. It is in consideration of these kinds of cases that I've insisted that positive models of freedom must require social recognition of one's practical identity, but as a contingent and flexible requirement, one that does not assume that such an identity is fully formed and fixed. It must be possible to pursue a path of freedom of this sort while at the same time renegotiating that social practical identity, perhaps in confrontation, though hopefully in supportive interaction with concerned others. A brief conclusion. As should be by now obvious, accounts of the contours of a political value like freedom will turn on the perspective from which the ideal is approached. In the condition of, uh, conditions of new forms of oppression and vulnerability we find in the current global landscape, the perspective of those struggling for liberty brings to light unique aspects of that concept as a social and political ideal. Political philosophy must do more to include such perspectives in as much as speaking for others, not to mention for the subaltern, in quote, is possible in the ongoing and complex social commentaries we embark upon. What I've tried to do here, if only provisionally, is to mark out some paths in such commentaries that strike me as less or more productive in various ways. But in doing so, I hope to have shown yet again the inestimable, inestimable value of Charles Taylor's contributions to these conversations across these many decades and throughout his rich intellectual legacy. Thank you. Thank you.